And the subject of tonight is a free soul. This means there are souls that are bound. Indeed, almost all souls in this world are bound. They have come into this world, according to Vedanta, born into this world, with a view to working out their karma, fulfilling their desires which they had left unfulfilled in the past lives. And now they have an opportunity to work out their karma by fulfilling their desires. And in the course of working out, they form fresh desires. The newer and newer desires possess their mind. And then, when, you know, when a man has desire or has many desires, he is bound by them. In trying to work out, he fails sometimes, sometimes he succeeds. And when he succeeds, he thinks he is happy but that's only for a short time. Then comes frustration on account of failure in working out one's desires. In failure leads sometimes to worse consequences. In this way he is bound. That's why most of the souls in this world are bound. Sri Ramakrishna used to compare them to fish that are caught in a net. The fish play about freely in the gleaming sun in the ocean water, and the fisherman casts his net. <coughs> and inside the net also the water gleams with the sun's beams, and then they rush in. <coughs> they rush in at great speed. Little fish and some of them big enough to get it through the net, and they are there. And then there are other fish that are just watching. They have got in but they are afraid they have gone to a new place and perhaps a wrong place and they come out. <laughs> they are a bit fortunate. <coughs> More fortunate are those fish are never caught in the net. They never get attracted by the gleam of the water in the net. They don't go in. And the fisherman after some time draws the net and smashes them to pieces. Those fish that escaped after having gotten are fortunate. In this way we may say, though most of the people of the, of the souls in this world are bound, indeed the exceptions are very few, very vast majority. Indeed almost all the souls, <coughs> all the people in the world, all souls that have taken flesh and blood, with a few exceptions are bound. And though bound, <coughs> they can, like the fish that having gotten, escaped successfully. Like them, they can also work out their karma and attain liberation. A man is said to attain liberation when he is free from these desires completely. He has no more desires in his mind, nothing attracts him, and then his mind is fixed on the Atman, the Self, the Soul, the Light Divine is fixed. Nothing can move his mind. Desires may come and go like water in the, wa in the river that flows into the ocean. <coughs> the ocean is not affected there. They just come in flow. But the mind is not fixed there. Mind is elsewhere. Mind is fixed on Brahman or the Atman and he always contemplates on the Atman-Brahman identity. The identity of his Self with the over-self, his soul with the over-soul. He concentrates on the identity between the pure consciousness in him with the pure consciousness outside, the thing in itself in him with the thing in itself of the universe. In this way he spends his life. Nothing attracts him. He doesn't make plans, but yet he is an active man. To be active to be devoted to Brahman, to be concentrated on the Self, at the same time work hard without a plan, this is special achievement. Others make plans, they fail, they succeed sometimes, they fail at other times. He doesn't, he's not a maker of plan. This is the type of man, the free soul that Vedanta has in view when it says hey, one must be a free soul. One must attain freedom of the soul. The soul is in bondage, you know, as it were. 
soul cannot really be in bondage. As a matter of fact, nothing can bind it. But it appears to be bound because body and mind are both limited and we identify the soul with them, we feel we are bound. <coughs> body and the mind are superimposed upon the self, the Atman, the Brahman. And then we think we are the body and mind. Man thinks he is body and mind and then he feels he is bound, he suffers. <coughs> when the body has ailments, he says, I am sorry, I am not at all well. I feel pain. Whole night I feel pain and ha not having slept at all, I sleep in the brief hours the morning or after dawn. He is a sufferer. He identifies himself with the body. Then the mind is afflicted sometimes by sorrow. It suffers from agony. See, some bereavement comes here or some frustration something he hoped for he could not achieve and then he suffers. Mental agony. It's not physical agony. He a very healthy man weighing perhaps, you see, eighteen stones. Heart is all right, lungs well. Well, such a man suffers mental agony. You can't do anything. He goes to a psychiatrist, well, they can't help very much. You know, the psychiatrists, what they are. He, he suffers from agony. He, because he's identified himself with the body, all the problems, with the mind rather. First body and then the mind. So whenever there's an affliction of, of a physical character or mental, he suffers. This is the trouble. It is because body and mind have been superimposed upon the Atman and he thinks he is, the Atman is that. He says, I suffer. Strictly speaking, the Atman is not bound, it's beyond all suffering. <coughs> and then how does it get bound then? Really the Atman is not bound. It's the Jivatman that is bound, not the Atman in man, which is pure consciousness, the Atman, the Brahman, the light. It always shines. When a man identifies himself with this pure consciousness which always shines, you see, then he is a fortunate man. Then there is this problem, there is the way shown, man has studied Vedanta, he is a thoughtful man, he is not attracted to the ordinary pleasures of life. Perhaps he wants, uh, for some years he was uh, enjoying and then had discrimination. Discrimination dawned on him, he gave up. <coughs> Well, he strives. Indeed, he is one who is fit to strive because of the dawn of discrimination in him. Though striving, he doesn't succeed. The mind doesn't get fixed on the self, the Atman or Brahman, the truth within. It slips down. It's like a pole. While the snail tries to ascend the pole during day, say, half a dozen inches slowly. But it is not possible for the snail to ascend at that rate every day. At night he sleeps. When he sleeps, he sleeps down far. <laughs> the net gain is only two. This way he goes on. And sometimes failure is such for the man who strives. He feels the whole world has taken off his feet. He feels he is absolutely helpless. But then there is this previous samskara, the habit, the, 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 the samskara or tendency of the mind strengthened by meditation and other forms of spiritual discipline for years, again he goes on. It's not an easy thing to ascend this ladder of spiritual life. It's extremely difficult, very slippery sometimes. That's why the Upanishads compare it to the Shurasiddhara, that is to say the uh, sharp edge of a blade, sharp edge of a blade razor blade. <coughs> the razor is very, you know, sharp. A man has to walk on the edge of the razor. It is like that. It is like a man, man who strives for this Atman or God, 
is like a man who walks on the edge of a sharp razor. And therefore it is said, it is extremely difficult, but by practice he succeeds. Here the stories of persons, you know, like Robert Bruce and the spider, persons who <coughs> worked hard, attained and finally won, <coughs> attained and fell, again attained and fell, finally had the attainment, the highest again. It's rather difficult. And this man, who is a free soul, has succeeded in the end. Perhaps he had his struggles, evidently everybody had his struggles. It is ridiculous to think that a man was born perfect and he remained perfect all through his life. <laughs> I don't expect that. Then he must be a baby without growing, he would be all right. When a man grows, all problems <coughs> afflict his mind, his body, all problems are there for him to solve by exercising his body, by exercising his mind with its will and other faculties. This is the story of man's life. And when he grows, he finds he has to struggle against external nature and internal nature. <laughs> the external nature is there, no doubt. Nowadays modern inventions are very helpful. You get warmed up in your room, but if elect electricity is cut down, <laughs> you feel hopeless. You have to go and buy a lamp perhaps with kerosene oil, as they call petrol. Candles are rather dangerous. <coughs> well, this is the problem of life, external nature. He went about freely in those ancient times, then it began to rain, <coughs> hailstone began to fall. Sometimes there was heavy snow and he found he was helpless. Poor man had taken to a wife, they both would run away from there to some place where they could hide their heads against the snow. Well, some cave they found out. They would get in and come out only when the snow was less heavy and the rain had stopped. Then he thought he could build a big cave with the help of sticks and timber collected and so on. He did that. Later on he built up excellent homes. Then there might come times, you know, when the chief architects of your city would be dissatisfied with the old mansions, though beautiful they are. You will pull them down and erect rectangular shaped homes, square sometimes, yes. Ninety degrees. No curve, nothing of the sort, nothing of what you call art of ancient times or modern times. Well, this way progress. Man therefore struggles against external nature always until he is established in a home, he marries and settles down, has children and so on. It's not sufficient, he is not peaceful. What you call the peace of life is away from the man, though he may be highly ethical and moral. Though without morality and ethics, spiritual progress is not possible, you see. Yet morality and ethics alone would not be sufficient to give peace to the soul of man. The soul wants peace. That can be acquired only in another way. One who thinks the peace is already within him, the problem is easier, but he has to strive to tear down the veils that hide peace from himself, from the realization of the peace. And the man who thinks peace is outside of him also has to struggle hard. You may think of it as a go as God or some entity, personify if you like, and so on. In this way, both external and internal struggle, external struggle and internal struggle rather, go on. And at last this man wins. And this is one of those who struggle. The free soul struggled hard. His main struggle was how to exercise discrimination and not fall. <coughs> there are a few books, of course, the Upanishadic references are there, are always eloquent, you know. You may read some of the Upanishads which speak of the characteristics of the man of God. Now one thing is there, in the books it might be said he is a man who is peaceful, he is a man who has conquered wrath, attachment, aversion, greed, all these. See, Vita Raga, uh, 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 Vita Raga, Bhaya Krodha, the attachment, Raga is gone, Krodha, anger is gone, Bhaya, fear is gone. 
the fear of death for example fear of being robbed when you have possessions this is great one of the greatest fears is a wealthy man <coughs> and then fear of being taken away bodily sometimes say a child may be taken away taken into a jungle and they ask for ransom you see you hundred thousand dollars all these complications are there possession is always fraught with fear now the problem is this this man is not at all afraid nothing can deprive him of the peace of his soul which has already attained that's a great man this is the goal that vedanta holds for uh, men to attain now there are some valuable books upanishads are there no doubt and then <coughs> there are other uh, valuable books like the bhagavad gita for example and there is one book by vidyaranya muni the great teacher um who commented on the rigveda very valuable commentary he produced sayana acharya they say both of them are identical some say they were two brothers indian chronology is so vague you know they lived after all only about 600 years ago but indian 500 years ago indian chronology is absolutely vague <laughs> shiramakshna was born in the last century well some of them at home you would celebrate his birthday even from childhood you know that's a like this in all countries they would celebrate they knew the the date of birth they knew what you call the day on which he was born according to the moon lunar calculation <coughs> they remembered that and the month also finished uh, year they forgot <laughs> you are to celebrate not your year of birth but celebrate the day of birth you forget the year a historian cannot do anything a chronicler or a biographer later on they found out with great difficulty he was looked upon he, it was considered that he was born in 1834 later they found he was born in 1836 he himself could not tell well these are wonderful people in india <coughs> very great nation with not much of an ancient history well you find it's interesting the bhagavad gita gives a good idea of this man of freedom real freedom he has shaken off everything he is free and one book as i told you sayana acharya is this jeevan mukti viveka this tells us it gives us a very valuable description of the man who has attained this freedom of soul you can discern such a man you can find out oh it may take time he is a man of peace <coughs> another thing <coughs> is a man of purity purity and peace go together well let's start nothing can shake his mind thirdly he is a loving man a kind hearted man they use the words maitri karunaya vacha that is to say he is a man of compassion for anything and everything you can't use the word compassion is too bad a poor beggar was there you know and one of his feet was gone either in the war or from birth while well, you just give him a few pies you know few pence that compassion what compassion is nothing extraordinary in that <laughs> compassion is exercised by a man who can exercise and the man removes the misery of life forever that is the man who exercises compassion towards the man who was in misery that is compassion a man was in debt say uh, 50000 pounds he borrowed he could not pay and he was in trouble see he goes to a millionaire and appeals he says don't you worry i will pay off that money you may go home and he just issues a check for 50000 pounds to the man from whom the other had borrowed see this is kindness he say now compassion is much higher than all this a man suffers and the man who has attained freedom a man of god say one whose mind is fixed in the atman in brahman in truth always <coughs> he says why all this suffering 
because your eyes are not at open. Come and come now and then. Yes, he goes now and then. He one day slowly opens the eyes. You see. Not by operation <laughs> of any kind, you know. He, he, he sees things in the true light. He <coughs> attains God. Imagine this man. That is compassion. In that sense it is that the Upanishads use the word Maitri Karunaya Vacha. Karuna itself is compassion. Maitri is love, absolutely free, what you call impartial affection for all, impartial love. There is no partiality in this man. Now, <coughs> this is then said of these people, these are some of the characteristics of these three souls. How to attain these characteristics? Suppose you find in the books one should be peaceful, well, when a visitor comes one will be very, very peaceful. The man, the visitor goes away after half an hour, this man has started, you see, worrying himself. <laughs> that is not a peace that is spoken of here. <laughs> and then purity, well, well uh, they, uh, you know, there are charlatans as they are called. Well, they go on. <laughs> You know, feeling in the mind, you know, that he has erred, that he has made serious mistakes. He was on in his own merry way. It's a sh perfect shot, well established Charlotte. <laughs> but the man who has qualms of conscience feels that he has made a mistake, he practices austerity for twelve years. Imagine this man. That's his real conscientious man. And he becomes pure. Then you can trust him. You see. But in this man there is no struggle, he is well established in purity. And then he is a man of love, impartial love for all he has, impartial, absolutely. That means he, he has transcended the idea of nationalism in you. You see, unless while the children are Jewish I won't help or unless they are Protestants of the Church of England especially, I won't extend my relief to those people. Unless one is a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian, I won't give. I must belong to my faith. And those who appreciate this may give charity to me. Others may not appreciate, they also may are welcome to send their, uh, their possession, whatever they can give, say or money and things like that. This is sure. This relief is intended only for the Protestants of the, of the Church of England or the Protestants, say, of Germany or the Christian element in church in Russia. Those who follow communism only will follow you. you will. Oh, awful. But this man is not like that. <coughs> Absolutely impartial love for all. He sees directly the soul in man. See, that is the perfect way. That is the way with him. He doesn't inquire who he is, how he is and so on. As soon as he comes, he sees the soul in him. Then only he begins to talk. He's a very great man. You see, this is the ideal of India. Even now it is the ideal. Not to produce only the great statesmen and politicians not to produce great industrial magnates and commercial princes. That is the greatness in its own way, no doubt. In these countries you have tremendous greatness. Scientific explorers and discoverers. That's all very good indeed. They say this is not sufficient. Finally he must be able to attain God in this very life. Then he is a great man. That they reserved for this fourth stage of life. They shook off everything and contemplate on the truth within them, or the truth outside, whatever we call called God outside, God inside. God is everywhere. Surely God also is within man. He meditates, he contemplates on him, attains the truth. They say this is the highest way of life. Others are good and great, no doubt, socio-economic necessity. They had a program of life, you know, the student and the householder and then the forest dweller. And then came what you call the monk, who left off everything. You may call him monk or anybody else, a truth seeker, say, a perfect truth seeker. 
Sometimes these words cause confusion. Everybody cannot be a monk in this world. Then who, who would feed the monks if everybody is a monk? It's an awful job. Most of the people should be of the late. Then only the few monks can thrive properly. <laughs> well, this is the position. The fourth stage of life, they said, that is for, to be set apart. At least some years, the last few years, say, or twelve years. In ancient times they divided life into four parts. They lived long enough, I suppose. The last seventy period, quarter, seventy-fifth to hundredth year, you see, those twenty-five years were devoted to the spiritual life and attainment. Nowadays they don't go so far. They say, well, we shall marry and settle down. By fifty-six the man retires. He's really sixty. He has falsified his horoscope. See, four years more he earns, then he retires, studies the Bhagavad Gita just very seriously, only at that time. He doesn't let you go up to 68, 70. How can you take sannyas after? Because he has put up till 75. It's very interesting. You see, that is gone almost from India. <coughs> the ideal is in the blood of man in, in all the, almost all the Hindus, excepting those who have taken to Western ways of life by coming here to study. And some of them are attracted by this country, you know, with its facilities. They settle down here. This is the way then. They always sought for truth, and this man has attained that truth. That is the free soul. And see what the Gita has to say about this great soul. He says, Arjuna once asked Krishna, you know, how you have been telling about this great truth that there is in man, and he is a jnani who attains this truth. But I do not follow. Can you tell me about such a man? What are his ways of his what is his way of life? How he lives, how he moves, how what he how he eats, sits, speaks? And Krishna gives a, a beautiful answer. And in recent times Mahatma Gandhi used to repeat it every day. Evidently that was the ambition of his life, to attain to that stage in which truth is revealed and man becomes free. Man cannot become free without what you call attaining the truth. That is not possible. Physical freedom, mental freedom or intellectual freedom, see, and spiritual freedom. Freedom of the soul should come. In a country where we deny physical freedom even to people, well, that is not good or in an age or country where spiritual freedom is denied or intellectual freedom is denied, you see, persecution of the great geniuses sometimes, who are often butchered, some of whom rather, or at least a few of whom, and spiritual freedom are lacking. Put the girl upon the stick, <laughs> set fire. You see, this is no good. Well. Here is a man who has attained perfect freedom of soul, crossing all these barriers. And he says here, Krishna was asked, you know, let me have an idea of this man of steady wisdom. His wisdom is steady, you know, not interrupted by desires now and then. Everyone can think of the Atman, of God, of soul, see what we call pure consciousness, that light divine. Well, after some time it goes. The thought is, thought leaves the man. Other thoughts invade the mind of man. And here he speaks of one whose wisdom is steady. It's like a burning lamp, a you know, lamp which constantly burns. Day and night, all the twenty-four hours a day. And until he passes it is there. Then he enters that light. Well, here he says, when a man completely casts away, Krishna replies, you know, the other the Bhagavad Gita, when a man completely casts away all the desires of the mind, satisfied in the self alone by the self, always, you see, contemplating on his self. He doesn't struggle to contemplate, 
what your pratyahara was long, long, many years ago established in gathering of the mind. <coughs> the mind is being acted upon by the centrifugal forces of the world, objects that he has seen, things that he has heard, even the memory of it is a hindrance. He has conquered them all by practicing successful pratyahara, in gathering of the mind, and then he has gone further, he is established in contemplation. He is always his mind is always fixed on Brahman or the Atman. So he says, constantly he is satisfied in the Self alone by the Self. He is given up all the desires of the mind. By discrimination, by practice, by habit, is well understood. Then he is said to be one of steady wisdom. His wisdom is not broken, but steady not interrupted, but continuous. Then again he says, that is the first question that is answered. Mm. What kind of man, what type of man, who is in samadhi, <coughs> then he whose mind is not shaken by adversity, man is all right, the normal man, you know, he is like a parrot. You teach the parrot or the bhajrigar, you see, it can chant the Vedic text if you like, say for ten minutes, teach properly, if the tongue is tender. Well, but when the cat comes, it cries, kaka and dies. <laughs> that is the fate of the ordinary man. Who is wonderful, he is glorious, you see, newspaper emblazoning here and there, every year, almost once a month or twice a month goes on. He is a wonderful man. His health is all right. His mind is all right. Well, that is not sufficient. That is not sufficient. When adversity comes, he succumbs, you see. He becomes helpless, desperate. And that is why he says here, he whose mind is not shaken by adversity, he has attained the peace of life. That is the whole secret of it. His soul is in perfect peace because of his having fixed his mind upon the Atman, on Brahman. The habit was formed perhaps years ago <coughs> and his mind is fixed. He is not shaken by adversity, who does not hanker after happiness. Mm. I think the other would be better thing, the other course would give you better results. Go on planning after happiness. <laughs> they, they can't seek, find out they are. Is attain perfect happiness within himself, within the self. Well, there is the man does not hanker after happiness. He has become free from affection, free from attachment or passion. Fear and wrath, vidha raga bhaya krodha, vidha, without raga attachment, bhaya fear, and krodha wrath. The wrath comes when a man is not able to fulfill his desires, or somebody is in the way. He smashes that man to pieces, you know. That can explain some of the shootings and so on. He prevented him from grasping the object of his love, of affection. And then fear comes. Well, there will be fear so long as man has not identified himself with the fearless one. And who is the fearless one? Uh -huh. You may call it God or some entity, an everlasting entity, may say, or if you like to call it pure consciousness. Modern man doesn't, even college boys and school boys say, we'd be under religion without God. If you use the word God, they feel disgusted. It is pure consciousness, if you like, or Atman, the Self. His mind is fixed, you see, and he is so strong in his love of this truth, this Atman, that there is no fear in him. Fear can go only when there is the fearless one is behind us or within us, otherwise we should be always afraid. This man has no fear. And attachment, fear and wrath, these are the mm, three enemies of man. He is the man of steady wisdom. 
then again he who is everywhere unattached wherever he may go whatever he may be is unattached not pleased at receiving good nor vexed at evil all people did the hospitality and thing like that you see they were very happy well that's all right in another place uh, to another place he went well they spoke ill of him and they said he, you, you are a drone upon society so, uh, well that's the way of looking at things some people he is not vexed at all his mind is always fixed you see man of steady vista you can't disturb him at all so he is not vexed at receiving evil nor pleased at receiving good his wisdom is fixed such a man then again is very interesting highly psychological too when also like the party sits limbs he can completely withdraw the limb the senses from their office now the senses are attracted by objects which are attracting <coughs> that is how the senses are misled you know and this man may be moving about objects of senses rather attractive objects of senses which attract the senses of man but he is free from them he may be moving about the moment he wants to withdraw his whole mind is gone is taken away from the senses and sense objects and meditate and fixed upon the other that is the greatness of the man he is therefore this action of his you see by which he takes to the mental process of withdrawing the moment he sits down say or he wants to withdraw he is gone it was so this is compared to this activity this action of his is compared to the thought is tucking up its limbs at the sight of danger must have seen the thought is doing that such a man is wisdom is steady this this way they speak about the steady man he he is the free man the word free is not used the subject is free soul this is this is this way it is that he becomes a free soul is perfect in his pratyahara he moves about the world objects of senses attractive and all that the moment he wants to withdraw act on it he has practiced it he is not affected that's why they often compare such a man's life to the drop of water in the lotus leaf <coughs> you may have other leaves too here in this country you know you pour, put a drop of water it will just shine and flow out it doesn't wet the leaf in india we usually speak of the lotus leaf the drop of water in the lotus leaf it's not wet it's it's immersed in water it's not wet by water then again you know uh, the idea is he shakes himself clear of all impressions of the sense world where he had been moving about and then goes into samadhi with the ease and naturalness naturalness of a tortoise tucking its limbs withdrawing its limbs within, <coughs> within itself at the sight of pain <laughs> a wonderful man objects fall away from the abstinent man leaving the longing behind but his longing also ceases who sees the supreme this man has seen the supreme therefore he is free the abstinent man is struggling still he is like a fasting man suppose you fast on the 11th day of the moon or on some say every sunday or once a fortnight then you you see take take a vow you would not eat anything from morning till evening or from evening to next evening some times anyhow 36 hours fast is said to constitute a complete day in india because night 12 hours after all night eight and hours people don't eat at all you see six seven hours they don't eat it is included in the 36 hours well it's a man who fast like that it does not mean that he is incompetent to eat <laughs> incapable of eating oh no he can eat well 
<coughs> is Einstein. The, lo- the desire, maybe they are to eat, but he suppresses that. The man who abstains for spi- in spiritual life also is like that, but once he has attained the supreme, the longing also goes. The longing, the 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 the, the lurking desire, you see, the innate samskaras and vasanas, as we call, tendencies and impressions of the mind, are kept under check for years. It may be many years, but yet. You can't say he has attained the Supreme, but when he attains the Supreme, this longing goes, the samskaras are extinguished completely. Then they may ask, well, why not the Supreme come then, <laughs> put out all the old, in, what you call instincts, you see, destroy all the samskaras. No. The idea is this, a man has to purify himself and go upward, then God descends downward and meets the soul, as it were. When he attains the Supreme, his longing is destroyed. Unless his longing is destroyed, he can't attain the Supreme. This is also true. You see. Unless all the old impressions are destroyed. Karmanasa and Vasanakshaya we call the decay of old tendencies. And the decay becomes complete when the Supreme is seen. This is also true. So these are interdependent. And then he also says, the turbulent senses violently snatch away the mind, striving after perfection. Even a wise man, not steady wisdom, <coughs> not a man of steady wisdom, but he is wise enough. The steadfast, having controlled them all, sits focused on me as the Supreme. This wisdom is steady, whose senses are under control. And then again he says, See, it's very interesting. He traces the psychology, uh, gives the psychology of attachment. You know. Thinking of objects, attachment in them is formed in a man. I just look beautiful, fine, attractive. From attachment comes longing. From longing, anger grows. You must have. It takes possession, you know, you want to they use the word possessive nowadays, you know, very freely sometimes. After Freud and Adler and Jung and others, <laughs> Mike Dugan. Possessive. Well, in one sense it is true. Man wants to possess what he likes or loves. Then from anger comes delusion. He is thrown into a fit of anger, you know. And if anybody comes in between, oh, such a hell of a uproar he, he makes. Well, then from this anger comes delusion. The mind gets, you see, upset. And from delusion, loss of memory. Loss of memory, you should take it in an ordinary sense of memory. He went, sat for the examination, he couldn't answer all. He couldn't remember the answers properly. He studied well. Not that. This is pre Adamic memory. That is the memory of that self which was t- untainted. That is pure, the self in man, the Atman. No ego is there. That is the uh, memory he speaks of and loss of memory that goes away. He does not know his identity, he thinks he is completely identified with anger, not with the self. (laughs) And then from loss of memory comes the ruin of discrimination. And from the ruin of discrimination he perishes. He perishes, not totally, but wait for a long time to come, to rise again. It's a fall, you know, it's a moral fall. Moral fall is practically the same as spiritual. Then again he says, the self-controlled man, moving among objects with senses, under restraint, moving among objects with senses under restraint, rather, free from attraction and aversion, attains to tranquility. He's not at once he tucks himself with <laughs> takes all the mind inward, bit of what you call pratyahara of Raj Yoga, he practices at once, it's In tranquility all sorrow is destroyed. Mm. That's the tranquil soul. The tranquil soul is one 
in whom you find all sorrow is gone. And you might remember perhaps in time. That's nothing. That memory is nothing. It can't taint you. <coughs> but in, an, in the case of an ordinary man who has not attained the highest, oh, memory is sufficient to put him out. You tell something, his whole subconscious is upset. And he's mad. Sometimes by the use of words you can upset a man or a woman. Children are upset by the use of words sometimes. Hmm. But this is not, it's not the case with this man. <coughs> it's completely tranquil. And in that tranquility all sorrow has been destroyed. Even the memory doesn't disturb him. Somebody might have done him harm, say. Then he was in sorrow, but he has later attained the truth, <coughs> the self, the Atman, Brahman, God. God. And somebody might have remained in him, it's nothing, it doesn't disturb. You see, the certain memories are harmless. You see, as children, a newborn baby, you see, well, uh, a, a grown-up man might have in, in that condition, you know, when he was a newborn baby, or done things which you see, he would not like to do, <laughs> repeat, <laughs> you see, he, as, as dirtying the swaddling clothes, you see, and things like that. Well, suppose a man remains him while I saw you doing, well, he is not going to be ashamed of that, whatever it is. <laughs> that, uh, it's such a, a faint thing, you know, that memory is harmless for him. It doesn't disturb him, the memory of his old griefs, you see, it doesn't disturb him. He is not there to remember. Suppose some occasion arises when he remembers, it's nothing. Doesn't waste His mind is fixed elsewhere, you see. In tranquility all sorrow is destroyed. The intellect of him who is tranquil-minded is soon established in firmness. <coughs> that is in the case of the man who is just going to get firm and steady. No knowledge of the self has the unsteady. <laughs> Nor has he meditation. <laughs> you ask them to sit, well, very difficult, very inconvenient. In five minutes, you see the man, well, this, this is not good for me, <laughs> he leaves the place. Or if he tries, struggles, you know, oh, then the limbs well, feel pain, and the neck feels pain, see, sitting up, and all that. well, finally leaves, you see, in ten minutes. Well, the, so, you see, it's a practice. To the unmeditative there is no peace. <coughs> when a man meditates upon God as peace, Shanta Mubhasita, that is one of the injunctions of the Chandogya. Shanta Mubhasita, meditate upon Brahman or Atman as peace, God as peace. To the unmeditative there is no peace, and how can one without peace have happiness? Hmm. The mind which follows in the wake of the wandering senses carries away his discrimination, as a wind carries away from its course a boat on the waters. Wind tossed condition you know, of the boat. It may sink any moment. Like that the mind is thrown off its balance, drifting. The man of unmeditative habits, man who has no meditation, so peaceless. Therefore, his knowledge is steady whose senses are completely restrained from their objects. That is, again, he comes back to the same story. Complete self sense control. Then he says, That which is night to all beings, in that the self controlled man wakes. is full of God consciousness, you know. And therefore he is said to be awake, but the ordinary man is not awake there. And where the ordinary man is awake, it is night to this man. Ordinary man is very happy in moving about, you see, in the world of duality, of pluralism, you see. He wants this, he wants that, like this. But this man sees only night there, he is not happy. 
He is not susceptible to the influences of nature. That's the whole thing. Nature cannot cheat him anymore. <laughs> because nature has been cheating, it is therefore rather that man had to feel attracted it again and again, being born again and dying again to be born again. And slowly the man of discrimination finds, you see, nature has been deceiving me. It's nature that has been deceiving me. Prakriti or Maya. See, I thought it was all right. And then when the discrimination comes, he stops. He turns the struggle inward, not to get outward, to conquer external nature and be happy and all that, see, by becoming externalized, by getting the mind externalized or you know, making it too extrovert, say. Man does not attain a complete happiness, so he turns his mind inward becomes introspective at that stage. That's what he means here. And this man is not susceptible to external influences of nature. But the, the other type of man, you know, oh, he is swayed hither and thither by the influences of nature. He is subject to this influence greatly. Then he speaks of his mind, you know, this man's mind. Krishna speaks of the mind of this man of <coughs> steady wisdom, this free soul. As into the ocean, brimful and steady, see, flow the waters of the ocean, uh, of the rivers. Even so, the Muni into whom enter all desires, he, and not the desire of desires, attains peace. He is peaceful, though many desires may come pass through his mind. You know. Nature attracts him, no, he doesn't listen at all. They are like water flowing through a bridge or through the river, emptying itself into the ocean, and washing for all that is brimful and steady. That's the type of and devoid of longing, he lives, abandoning all desires. Without the sense of I and mine, he attains to peace. Well, this is the uh, this is how Shankara begins his commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. You see. In this universe, we find there are two entities. You see, I and the universe, the subject and the object. He starts his philosophy like that. Now, when the subject feels, how can we say we are the subject, we, the consciousness of I is there. So long as there is a speck of life, the consciousness of I is there. Even the little worm, you know, the humble creature, because it has life, it's a living thing, it has I consciousness. And for it, that I and the universe outside. These are the two entities it begins with, in man's case, of course. His own and his his being, his the ego in him, say the subject, and the universe outside. Now, in the long run, man finds, you know, that he has been exercising this far too much. Say, I and mine. That disturbs his mind. That is me. That's me. That's mine. No doubt, that kind of egoism is good. You see, it's positive if it enhances our uh, a sense of discipline. I won't do this, sure not. I won't touch it. That kind of ego is good. It's strengthening, you know. Afterwards it will transcend itself. That is strengthening, of course. Control. Surely I will realize God. Many have realized before me that determination, you know. But in the long run he finds it is I and mine that become bondage. This is of course for the spiritual man, highly spiritual, evolved man. And then he gives up the sense of I and mine, 
he such a man attains to eternal peace that means the one has one's being in brahman you know even at the time of death it is there it, he clings to this eternal truth and nothing else is not disturbed this is the free soul of which vedanta speaks and this is important in society to produce such man and that's why in india we have the tradition whatever a man may have achieved in life is he may have for example the divine prime minister of a country what are the things well he should in the long run take to another life that is the highest we should take him to the highest this is the tradition in india the fourth stage of life to do that so to sum up the free soul is one that has attained peace of mind purity in life and also impartial love by the jeevan mukti vidhi and of course it may be said that these are the characters one can't try to imitate and say well i am trying to be jeevan that's no good at all when one attains this state this freedom naturally one will have all these characters when the sun rises you know what it is before it also you find the horizon changing in hue its color is a crimson glow of heaven and all that comes you know before then you have the dawn now anyway, the sunrise and after sunrise also it's different that is the ideal man the free man who loves the whole world because it's of his impartial love is pure purity itself and who is peace itself 